I've been thinking about um, uh, this Plan B series that I'm on, and it can go so many directions. You can use just about every scripture to, to uh, implement a plan of attack for a pastor to, to preach out of. So just this week, it just was, fell upon me as I was working with a family who had experienced the loss of uh, Mrs. Moffat as she passed away last week and ministering to them and, and in many ways needing the beauty of this uh, special psalm in my own life and also offering it to the family. I said, well, why not just preach on it? So here it is for you this morning. It's plan B, facing life with God's help. You know, we have a helpmate. We have one right alongside of us as we travel this journey who will never leave us or forsake us, never abandon us, and is always ready to give more so than, than we are ready to see, receive or even have knowledge of. This morning, I, I want to begin, though, with a thought of how in our life sometimes, what are the, the, there's big times that we want God to come into our heart and our lives and, and then there are maybe those, those little times where we don't ask or, or don't look for that and we need him just equally as much. And just looking at, thinking back and I don't know why this prompted me this morning because it kind of hit me as I was doing the final touches this morning. I thought back of, of I guess something must have prompted me. But remember, some of you remember 1962. You remember the big event that happened in 1962? John Glenn. John Glenn. He went up in the Mercury spaceship. How many were glued to their TV? I was nine years old. Were you glued to your TV and watching Jules Bergman, probably? The scientist on ABC TV, I believe, where he was at. Now, you're too young for that. And you guys are too young for that. But history lessons, all part of preaching, right? And. I, one of my seminary classes said you need to preach with the newspaper in one hand, the Bible in the other. But uh, so this is a history lesson in the Bible in the other, I guess. But in that year, John Glenn made the first manned U.S. man, not not international, because Russia had already beat us, which was some fear and trepidation on our part in the U.S. because we thought we were behind, right? You remember that we were we were second place at that point. And America doesn't like to be second place, like Kentucky. Uh, so. We, we, so we were wanting to, to act fast. And John Kennedy, I mean, he put the money and the emphasis, the President Kennedy, that that might happen and, and spoke to all of us about we're going to have a man on the moon before the end of this decade. And we did. But going back to this, he circled the Earth how many times? Was it 20 times? No, three times. He's in orbit for three circles of the Earth. And he was up there about five hours, that's all. And then the splashdown, and that was always the thing. You know, that thing float. Well, that capsule float when it hits and all that, that kind of thing because they were testing a lot. And remember, today we would be doing all this with the, the best computers, the best horsepower, the, most, the, the best scientists. Everything that we had would go into that today. And, and back then in 1962, I don't think you had your laptop, and I don't believe you had your phone device, and I don't believe you had all. There wasn't all that available, so they were... Even slide rules and things like that were happening, trusting in humans. I'm sure when John Glenn walked into that capsule, here's where I'm finally getting my scripture, he had to say, God, you're my refuge and my strength, my present help in my time of need. He would have had to have prayed something along those lines. And I say that this morning because it's a great prayer to pray for any of us. As you get in the car to leave some places, you as you travel, as, as you are experiencing some kind of conversation with someone that you don't know what it's going to turn, how it's going to turn out, where it's going to turn to, as you're getting ready to teach a high school class tomorrow for the first time, all those things, count upon God to be your refuge and your strength, your ever-present help in your time of need. Therefore, I will not fear. My knees will be knocking in all those cases, but, I, but still, I know I'm grounded, right? And I think John Glenn had to feel that as he, as he went up and into that in this orbit at that time. I'm, and I say this now because we want to be grounded in the right person as we worship together and especially as we look to Lent. That's where our, and for the church, that's a reset, a refocus. As it's a re-time to remind yourself of who is the one we need to look through and to how we should look to him and, and to be in a land, I think, is a great time to be still and know that God is God and we are not. Let's pray before we go any further. God, we, 
lead us through this beautiful psalm this morning that you've given to us, that we might enjoy it. I, that's what I want. I, I pray, Lord, that we enjoy this psalm for all of its uh, accountability, for all of its worth, for, for all of its reality, and for all of it that it reminds us to, to, to be grounded in you. Amen. So we be still and know that I am God. So do that as you, you go through. Remind yourself as I'm speaking a lot of words up here. Because I got another story to tell you. Anybody remember this one? Anybody read this story? Do you remember this story, Matt? So uh, I don't know if we still have this book or not. But it, it was a story we read our children years ago. And uh, let me read you, tell you a little bit about Alexander. Because this might be your day sometimes. And how you might need to be still and be reminded who God is. Alexander was a boy about seven or eight years old. And he had one of those days when everything went wrong. Disasters, one right after the other. Nothing went right. It was a horrible, terrible, not good, very bad day. For instance, when Alexander woke up in the morning, he discovered that he had gone to bed with gum in his mouth, and when he awoke, it was in his hair. When he got out of bed, he tripped over his skateboard, and then he dropped his sweater into the sink where the water was running. He said, I just knew it was going to be a horrible, terrible, not good, very bad day. Then he went to school. And it turned out to be a horrible day, day there as well. After school, he had a terrible experience. Where? The dentist's office. Then came supper. And he said, we had cauliflower for supper. And I hate cauliflower. And on TV, all I saw was hugging and kissing. And I hate hugging and kissing. Then my bath water was too hot. And I got soap in my eyes. And I lost my marble down the drain. When I went to bed, Nick took back the pillow that he said I could have. And my Star Trek nightlight burned out, and I bit my tongue. And the cat decided to sleep with Nick and not with me. All in all, he said, it was a horrible, terrible, not good, very bad day. Now, Alexander had a rough one, didn't he? You had any of those lately? You had just a small fraction of those sometimes? Isn't it good to be reminded sometimes that you're not alone in that horrible, terrible, not good, very bad day. You have someone with you. Because if not, our stress level goes maxed out. It gets crazy sometimes. We we don't know what's going on. And and we can't stand it. We can't stand up against it. That's why this psalm has such a great flow to it. Reminding us of so much that's going on. And in the beginning, it starts, you know, it's tough. I know that. In the beginning, it's just, I'm there. And that's scripture to it to the nth degree you know i can't tell you exactly how you get spiritual maturity except you can learn it from god's word you can you can grasp it through prayer you can receive it through the holy spirit the person of god living in us but it takes time sometimes you have to experience a lot like alexander did going through life and a lot of the the bumps in the road a lot of and this year time of year it's potholes in the road and And you go in and you you hit bottom on some of those and you come out. But hopefully and prayerfully we grow and we mature and we learn. That's why salvation is a process in in Wesleyan theology. Now salvation itself is not a process. Salvation happens in an instant. But the continuation of it is sanctification. It's where we we grow onward. God's prevenient grace draws us to him. The the, the, sanctification. the permanence of it, of the justification of it, is that, yes, we are saved through grace of God. But then, we're not finished yet. We go on to maturity. And this is one of those psalms that, that helps us grow and helps us mature and helps us lead us down that, that traveling road that we're going on. So, anybody have any stress in your life? <laughs> oh, I heard, oh, a moan back there. Oh, oh, yeah. I hope one thing, as I mentioned, and some of you might be watching it, Don Skelton, one of our dear members, is in the emergency room right now. I hope they're relieving the stress of concern for he and his family and and Barb and Victor and all that are with him this morning about his health condition. And and I think of of Gary just started on Thursday, uh, his cancer treatment. There's a bit of stress with that, right, Gary? I know you, you take it all on and you're a very brave soul and all that. We know, but we know your heart. And it's not easy. We know what Stella's gone through since last May. 
And those are all, yeah, they, they build up inside us. They're, they're troublesome. They, they work on us. We know that happens within relationships, husband and wives. There's, there's those potholes. There's the, the kind of a rolling tide sometimes in relationships with one another. All those things that happen. But when those things are bugging you to the nth degree, remember you don't have to walk it alone. We have a Savior. He cares. You don't have to let it boil over to some extent. If you want to look at it. The pressure, it's a pressure cooker out there sometimes. And we let it build up. And I, I want to stop for a moment. I should have said this earlier. I just saw a note on this is that I had written down. When, did this, when was this psalm written? Was it an easy time in Israel? Israel did never have a whole lot of easy times, and especially not in all likelihood when this psalm was written. In the 700s B.C., the Assyrians were knocking on the door to Israel. They were looking to take all those, at least they were looking for the northern kingdom, the, the part they wanted, which is the, the, the more plush and, the, and the, the fruit-bearing land, and they were knocking on the door to take the people into captivity. So there was a lot of stress going on in Israel at this time as well. And then we're reminded, God is my refuge and strength. The psalmist wrote it this way. God is there. He hasn't left. He hasn't departed. He hasn't pulled the rug out from under me. He hasn't said, I'm taking a vacation. He said, I am there with you. Now, what is this trouble all about? God's my refuge and strength, my very present help in my time of trouble. Trouble in this sense, what I've learned means pressed in. Pressed in. It's pressed in. Kind of like you're in a rock in a hard place. Anybody been there? That, that stresses you out a little bit. A rock in a hard place, doesn't it? But then I found a little bit more on that that I want to read to you. The, the word it literally, mean, literally means, though, that trouble and the press in means that, that there's, it's like a pebble, a small stone, not a boulder, a small stone like you might get in your shoe. And you've had that where you've had a stone get in there and you, you're walking along and it just bugs you to death. And you think, well, I can keep going. It's not going to bother me. It's going to be, and you go a few more feet and what? You finally have to take it out. You finally have to remove that pebble in your soul. Your soul. And C.S. Lewis pointed out that the enemy, Satan, knows better than to hit us with a huge disaster or a huge boulder because that will only drive us to our knees. That will bring us back to him. And you remember after 9-11, several years ago, so many, the, uh, you know, that particular day, we opened the doors to our church and people came in and prayed. People even came in and prayed. I had one young mother that day who was so afraid that day. She was just fearful. She had young children and so fearful of what was going to happen. And, and it brought people to their knees. We had a worship service in Princeton that night where all the churches, not you know, we all seemed to get along well that night. All the different churches. It, it brought people together, brought people that huge disaster. But the, the, little, the little pebble, the little things that drive us, they're like annoyances, but they don't let us go. They, they become that thorn in the flesh that Paul had and he was able to stand up against through God's help. Or in ourselves, we sometimes have to just bear up against it and not let it paralyze us. Uh, you remember uh, the great Martin Luther? Martin Luther was, uh, the, of course, the reformer and uh, what we celebrated this year, 500 years of the Reformation. And Martin Luther, when he was uh, struggling the most, when he came against the, the church at this particular time and, and nailed those, thes those 95 points on the wall that, that he had an issue with the church on, and some of us might be able to do that today, and nailed those, he got in trouble for it. He wasn't a popular man in exact actually had to run for his life and ran, escaped and hid out all over Europe during this time. And while he was in that struggle of his own, he wrote, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Whatever happens, the power of God rests with me. He's my refuge and my strength as he went everywhere. And that's the only way I will get through it. So let's look at this psalm a, a little as we go through it. As we can break it down into in about three parts. Um, and we'll look at the first one. It's, the first part is, therefore, I will not fear. You know I like therefores. 
And therefore, if I count upon God in that way as a, as a refuge or a place, a strength, and, and there's trouble when I'm pressed in, when, I'm, when I've got pressure on me, I'm going to count on that. He's going to be an ever-present help in that time of trouble. And therefore, I will not fear. Uh, so as we look at this, it's a present help. And verse 2 then comes in and says, Therefore we not fear when we're pressed in, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea. And you're going to notice now in these first couple of verses, three verses actually, about things that are taking place in the natural world. Do we have tornadoes in southern Indiana? Fair amount of them. To the south of us, do they have hurricanes? Uh, don't we sit on, the, was it, is it New Madrid fault here that could be an a, a, a earthquake at any time? We've even, many have even, not requested, but you know, thought, well, California is going to fall off into the ocean one of these days. <laughs> and I was, at, back in 1993, I was working in California at that particular time when an earthquake hit. And I was in my hotel room. It was about 5, 5.30 in the morning. And I'm usually waking up about that time anyway. And all of a sudden, that hotel is shaking. Fortunately, I was right by the door. And I have never gotten out of a building so fast in my life. And, you know, that shakes you up. It scares you. And, and there was a tremendous amount of damage done in, in Southern California because of that particular earthquake. But here we say the earth gives away. It happens. The mountains. They, well, maybe California might fall into the sea. I don't know. It could say that could happen here. Though its waters roar and the foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Those are all worrisome things. Even though, it says, even though these things might happen. And we've seen evidence of many of these things happen, happening here. Uh, what was it, about 15 years or so ago, the, the south side of Evansville got obliterated over in the Newburgh, didn't it? From a terrible terrible tornado. I believe it was even in November, an unusual time to get that kind of storm. Those things happen. God is there. The presence of God. And, and after that, many of the people of God came in and responded to that. I remember our church came down. There was a group of us came down and helped out after that. So I will not fear. I will also, as we go to the next part, I'm not going to be moved. I'm going to be able to stand up while this is going on. And we see some more things that take place. There's a river whose streams make glad the holy city, the holy place where the most high dwells. God is there. She will not fall when pressed in. God will lift her at break of day. And we begin to look at how some of the other part of the world is in distress. Nations are in an uproar. Amen? Yeah, they are. Man, always under man's doings, it seems like, but nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, and the earth melts. Verse 7, here he is. The Lord Almighty is with us, even when we're pressed in, even when we're in trouble. The God of Jacob remains our fortress. See how Martin Luther was reminding us, a mighty fortress is our God. So we stay the course. We remain steadfast. The psalm moves on a little further from that. I will not be filled with stress then anymore. I will be equipped to stand up in all things. And Psalm 46, verses 8 to 9 say, Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. Acknowledging all these things that has happened, he, but he does make war cease. He breaks the bow, the bow and shatters the spear, and he burns the shields with fire. So that then we can be still and know that I am God. I don't, I don't know how I could get through a day without being reminded of this. More and more of my decisions as I've gone through life have been to the point where I've stilled myself, where I have allowed not my own thoughts or even the way I might have ordinarily have handled things to shine through without first then going before God and having my direction changed, having my thought process slowed down, having God do a work on me when I most needed it. Be still and know that I am God is maybe one of the most important instructions any of us could ever live out on our daily journey. When we're stressed, when we're pressured, 
when we when between a rock and a hard place, when the storms of life hit, whenever the the political situation of our own country or country against country seem to be so exas exas I don't know what to say, just exasperating might be the best word that we can't hardly imagine or understand it. Be still and know that I am God. God will be the first to be exalted in all the earth. I'm going to add verse 11, which says, the Lord God is that mighty fortress. That mighty fortress. He's the one that actually is the fortress around us. He protects us. Loves us, cares for us in all things. So yeah, we have stress. We have stress. I'm not, I guess, not urging that we so simplistic that we just all of a sudden just lay back and relax. I'm not sure it's that easy. But relax and re being reminded that you're not alone. In fact, Jesus gave us an invitation of how we might handle that. He said, come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden or stressed, and I will give you rest. I'll help you through that. There's three words so often in our society today that someone once said that we get so caught, we spend our days worrying, hurrying, and scurrying. <laughs> we have our, our cell phones out too much, our cars driving too fast, and our, and, um, our concern about every little thing that comes up. And I, I urge you, I plead with you, I, I give you greater hope that God will help you through those things. So some take-home stuff for today. God is always near, always as close as a prayer, as a request, as a calming influence. It says in John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into the truth. And God's truth is a righteous truth. He is available to us. He's a, through the, and remember, this is through the Holy Spirit. We were uh, talking, Teresa and I were discussing something, was it yesterday or the day before, about uh, maybe it's a Bible verse that you got yesterday morning, and I remember the Bible verse in it even now. But it was one of the. Uh, it was from First Corinthians, and Teresa said, "Is that for the Christian or is that for everybody?" And I said, "I my firm belief is that's for the follower of God. That's for the Christian." Yeah, remember that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Is that for everybody, or is that for the Christian? Well, in God's eyes, it is for everybody, okay? Because he wants us all to come to him. But for the Christian, it's actually how we should behave. And Paul wrote the epistles and, and the other writers, uh, whether it's Peter or, or any of the other writers of, the, of like, um, you know, like, say, Hebrews or Ephesians or Galatians or, or first, second, third John. John is the author of those. They were written for us as the body of Christ to know how to live and to act and to believe and to behave and remind ourselves that our body is a temple for the Holy Spirit, not to be abused and, and uh, take on all this worrying and, and fear going on in our lives. So remember that. More take-home stuff. God's power is greater than anything in the world. Greater than all those nations that war against nations. Greater is he that is living in me than he that is in the world, than Satan. Another great reminder. Satan is in charge of those who are not believers. But for you as the Christian, God's got a hold of you. Trust in him. Take that home with you. Take home point three, God's help when pressed in works when we can't help ourselves. Who is that helpmate? The Holy Spirit's called the counselor, the comforter, the helper, the, the, the presence in all things. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know even what we should pray for. I don't know in our, in our blank out time when we had prayer, if you didn't know what to pray for, it says right here, God knew what to pray for, for you. The Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Even when we can't help ourselves. God helps you. Promises? Absolutely. Wesley, my summation, John Wesley, and for those of you who don't know who John Wesley is, the founder of Methodism, great man that lived back in the 1700s, he kind of summed up 
all this. He came after Martin Luther. He says, the best of all, friends, God is with us. The best of all. Remember next week, begins on Saturday, our general conference within our United Methodist Church convenes in St. Louis and is to convene for four days to make some major decisions within the life of the church. The best of all, God is with us. That's what our prayer is for this body as they gather. Let's pray that now. Lord, we want to lift up our church just now. Um, you gave us a servant in Mr. Wesley who taught us so much by your guidance and by your hand because he had affirmed his heart before you. He was one of those men after your own heart. Lord, I pray that you sent 864 delegates to St. Louis seeking your heart first to govern and to guide, to, to um, follow and to lead. And uh, your church and your people. So we place all that in your loving and caring hands that you for them be their refuge, their strength, their very present help in their time of need. Through Christ our Lord.